Bonjour, good afternoon, everyone. I am Gabriel Miller, the Executive Director of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences. I am pleased to welcome you here this afternoon for our uh, Congress 2018 Big Thinking Lecture. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that the land on which we gather to hold the 2018 Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences is Treaty 4 land, the territories of the Nehiowak, the Anisinapec, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota Nations, and the homeland of the Métis. We are grateful for and impressed with the wonderful preparations undertaken by our Congress host and partner for the Big Thinking Lecture Series, the University of Regina. We thank them and the Indigenous communities in Regina for welcoming us here today. J'aimerais signaler avant de commencer que nous proposons un service d'interprétation simultanée. Vous pourrez vous procurer des écouteurs dans la salle située à l'extérieur du théâtre. Je souhaite remercier le Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines, la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation et Université Canada pour leur parrainage de la série de causerie Voix Grand. It is thanks to the generosity of these sponsors that we are able to make these events open to the public for all to enjoy. The Big Thinking series gives us a chance to engage in thoughtful conversations about pressing issues of our time. Today is no exception. We are delighted to welcome Françoise Bayliss, who will challenge intuitive ethical considerations as she discusses the responsibilities of scholars in public debate. I would now like to invite our dear friend, Tom Chase, Provost and Vice President with the University of Regina to, to introduce Francoise Bayless. Tom? Thank you, Gabriel. Welcome, bienvenue, Tansi, all scholars and members of the public who are present with us today. As Gabriel has said, we always acknowledge that we are here in Regina on Treaty 4 territory. Our Congress theme, Gathering Diversities, comes from proximity to a historical gathering place for many Indigenous peoples of this region. And all of us are following in that tradition by gathering this week to share knowledge and expertise and new ideas. We hope that you have been enjoying Congress. It's hard to believe that we're getting near the end of a very busy week, and it has been our great pleasure and honor to work with the Federation, Gabriel and his team, to host this event here on campus. Big thinking at this year's Congress. The idea is to present forward-thinking research to address pressing critical questions. And as you've noticed, and as you've seen in the media, for a first time ever at Congress, all of the speakers in the Big Thinking series have been women. The theme of the series is Transform, Inspire, Challenge, and today's speaker will, will do all of those things. So let me give you a few words, a little bit of information about our presenter, Dr. Francoise Bayliss. Dr. Bayliss is an inter internationally renowned bioethics expert her innovative work has stretched the boundaries of her field. Her research intersects policy and practice. That research focuses primarily on women's reproductive health and on genetic technologies. Dr. Bayliss is a member of the Order of Canada, as well as a member of the Order of Nova Scotia. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences as well. In 2017, she was awarded the Canadian Bioethics Society Lifetime Achievement Award. Her presentation today is entitled, The Responsibility of Scholars in Public Debate, Challenging Intuitive Ethical Consideration. Now we all know the traditional university mission is to create and then transmit knowledge. For some, the push for media presence and for professors to inform current affairs is perhaps antithetical to that mission or parts of it. Dr. Bayliss's view, which she will enunciate very elegantly in a few moments, is that all members of the Academy are fundamentally public servants and that it is our duty to share our knowledge with all. So we have what promises to be a very engaging talk 
And I'd ask you now to join with me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Francoise Bélis. Bonjour, c'est un très grand plaisir pour moi d'être ici aujourd'hui. Je voulais juste vous annoncer au départ que la présentation sera en anglais, mais évidemment, je suis bilingue, très confortable en français, et ça me ferait un grand plaisir de répondre à vos questions en français. Ceci dit, la présentation sera en anglais. So, what I want to do today is start by giving you a little bit of background about me, about the things I believe in, and then move on to the world in which we currently find ourselves and what I believe are the appropriate contributions of those of us who have the privilege of having a life in an academic setting. So in that context, you've already heard that I've said and I believe that ultimately we are all public servants. That was perhaps truer a little while ago when the government really did invest significantly in our uh, post-secondary in institutions, but I choose to believe that that's still actually important, that we are not privatized industries, and in that sense, it has important implications for what we think we ought to do with the knowledge that we have. And so what I'm making a claim of about right now is that that knowledge belongs to all Canadians and indeed the world. And so our obligations then are not only to transmit that information to those who have the privilege of going to university, but in fact to share and to inspire all citizens. In that context, I have over time come to develop a particular mantra by which I try to live my life and do my work, and that is the following, to make the powerful care. There was a time when I was naive, some would say I still am, and I thought that I was gonna change the world. And I now understand that I cannot do that. But what I might be able to do is to use whatever talent I have to entice those who have more power than me within the social and political systems in which we live to want to do something for them to exercise their power in a way that's meaningful and important. The way in which I try to make a contribution is through public engagement, And recently, I've actually changed my language around that, and it's no longer public engagement, it's public empowerment. And part of the reason for the shift in the language is because the language of public education and public engagement is being co-opted, and it seems to be more and more about proselytizing. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't have strong views and that I don't want to communicate them, but I want to empower people so that if they disagree, they know how to so that we're not just sort of talking at cross purposes. And why is it important to be able to disagree with me? Because I learn from that. I may learn how to make my own arguments stronger, or I may learn how to shift my arguments, and that's important. My area of expertise is ethics, and it's particularly informed by a feminist perspective. So that's the background in sort of a big picture kind of way, and I'm going to narrow it a little bit to the work that I'm doing right now, which is really around reproductive and genetic technologies. And right now, I'm doing a lot of work on the technology of CRISPR, which has to do with genome modification, and that allows me to frame this part of my talk as gene-environment interaction. And so what I want us to think about is us as the genes in some sense and the environment as the institution in which we work, and how are they interacting and what is that doing both to us and what are we able to do to the environment in which we find ourselves. And in that context, I want to say I have an eclectic background. I work and research on a number of discrete topics, but what holds it all together is the willingness and the interest in moving out of the academy and making a commitment to do both advocacy and activism. And that, unfortunately, right now, is still either misunderstood or actively, aggressively Um, disputed, shall we say. So in that context, what I want to do is just give you a little bit more background information where I'm able to talk about the external things that influence what we're able to do. And in that context, I'm looking specifically at highlighting for you the second point there, which has to do with the barriers that one encounters in an environment that ought to constantly be fostering new knowledge and the dissemination of that new knowledge. And yet it's not always straightforward, and why? Well, I think that one of the things that becomes really important to understand in this context is the structural disincentives. So in that context, I want you to think about the following. Increasingly, and I'm just 
looking at my academic lifespan, increasingly what's important is that we be able to get research grants. And I've had many conversations where I now have senior people within the institution telling me that the success of my research can be measured in the number of dollars that I'm able to attract. And that's deeply problematic. And as an academic, I'm constantly having to write reference letters for my graduate students and my postdocs. And when I do that, I actually try to do the best that I can, and so I read the advertisement very carefully so that I'm able to say, yes, this student can meet all of those expectations. But I am increasingly distressed when I see this for a intro level position, that what you're looking for at a major university, and these are philosophy jobs, right? These are not people who need a lot of money to do their work, right? These are not people working in labs. These are not people who are necessarily doing empirical research, et cetera. So I'm not saying that there's not a lot of very important research that requires a significant financial investment. But there's a lot of ways of understanding research that isn't tied to dollars, and yet we're making that a measure of success. But even so, we're pulling it back in the time frame. It could determine whether or not you get a job. Now, let me say really loudly and clearly, I don't know that I would be hired today. And yet, I've had a wonderful, privileged life as an academic. When I got my first job, I didn't have a single publication. My graduate students leave and are fighting for that first job, and they have 10, 12 publications, numerous conference presentations. Some even have small grants that they've succeeded, and they're still clawing at getting a decent job. The world has changed, and it's harder for people. And in that context, one of the things that's interesting is that I've heard of the saying, you know, publish or perish, and yet even that now, I think, is being supplanted by something else, and we need to worry about that because what it does is it changes what we value and it changes the people we attract. And so one of the things that I want to say loud and clear is that the contributions academics have to make ought not to be measured in terms of the resources that they can bring to the institution that is housing them. The part that becomes difficult is that we are well trained to do certain kinds of things and this is what you see, this is what we know how to do. And yet look at the world around us and we will become irrelevant if we cannot bring these two things together. There's absolutely no point my writing a lot of great articles that get into great journals and I can claim some high impact factor and truth be told, we've got my 10 friends that are reading what I've said, right? This is the world in which we live and if we don't understand how to bring down those barriers and go out into that world and make important contributions, we will become irrelevant and we ought not to because we have so much to give. We have so much to give, but look at what we're trained how to do and look at what we get measured on. Many of you will know of this particular scandal. One of the things that was important for this is that there were many people who were involved, many academics who stood up, but because I already had a public profile and had a certain comfort level with the media, I was asked to be the public face of this event. And the thing for me that is sad to this day is that we had an opportunity to be ahead of the curve. Some of us saw what was happening in the world. And part of the way in which I understood what was happening in the world is that the caretaker in my building, the day that this happened, was waiting for me to arrive because she knows exactly when I arrive for work every morning at 8.30. And she waited and she had torn this cartoon out of the newspaper and showed it to me and said, Francoise, look, look at what they're saying about us in our university. And the next meeting I went into at 9 a.m. is I said, we have a serious problem. And the way I know we have a serious problem is it's a cartoon, and cartoons are very important ways of communicating things. And because my caretaker waited for me, she wanted to make sure that I knew there was a problem. This really, for me, was when I transitioned that it wasn't just about public speaking, which I've always enjoyed and liked to do, but it was really about political action in a different way. It wasn't just about the transmission of knowledge. It was explicitly about the transmission of values and about standing up and being heard. And since then, I've continued to do that kind of work. I want to share this with you because I think this still fits within the realm of academia, but it's an example of activism that's not actually as public as the other event was. And this is about the monk debates. And in 2015, there was a monk debate on progress. And can you believe it? All four speakers were men. So I wrote to the organizer, Mr. Griffith, and I said, gee, 
progress, and it didn't occur to you to have a single woman as a speaker? And then I said, maybe this was an attempt at irony. Will the next one be also about progress, but with four women? And I have to say to you, I had to send a version of that email four times before I got an answer. It was close to a month, and I'm sure he thought I was just a troll, right? And I can tell you, for those of you who have had trolls, it's not a lot of fun, but I think this is probably the closest I've come to being a troll. And in the end, he did answer me, and what he said is, well, Francoise, we did do it once, and it was an epic fail. I mean, he didn't use that language, but he said, we have had a panel of all women, and we got a lot of negative press. And I thought to myself, oh, I, I actually didn't know that they had done that. So I went and I looked to find out what was this panel of all women. And the topic for that was not progress. The topic for that was, are men obsolete? <laughs> and I thought to myself, so that's what women are skilled at? That's what we're invited to talk about? Well, of course you got criticized, and I'm very glad that you got criticized. But you're not being criticized for having four women. You're being criticized for having given four intelligent women a not-so-intelligent question, right? I mean, so that's a really important thing to think about. And so I want to take just a couple of seconds to say congratulations. Congratulations for having done something different at Congress and for having had four women to this point, because one of them is now going to be this evening. And please, if you can, come this evening as well. So a total of five of us from different walks of life with different perspectives come and speak. And I've taken the opportunity to put up a quote from another article that I found just this past week, and I would encourage you to look at it, because when I read this article, I said, that's me. I've never described myself as a prickly woman, but you know, that's me. And the thing that's wonderful about that article is it says explicitly, you need prickly women, because they're the ones that are going to tell you about what's wrong in the academy. And they will stand up, and they will fight. And that's what I think I'm doing right now in a very broad sense because I'm worried about what I see as the commercialization and the corporatization of my home, of my sandbox, where I have had the privilege of playing for a very long time and where I want other people to have the privilege of playing for a very long time because it is through that play that you have creativity and that you have opportunities for changing the world. I am not saying the other women are prickly. I don't know them personally. I am claiming that for myself. Having said that, that's kind of all meant as background. And now I'm just going to share with you a little bit of my current work and try to put it in a broader context. And this is really just to illustrate what I mean by stepping outside the academy. And I want to show you really clearly that stepping outside is not the same thing as stepping away. So what you do right now in the university is deeply important, and you need to keep doing that. But you need to spread your wings, and you need to do a few other kinds of things. So what I'm saying right now is I disagree with my colleague, Eric Montpetit. And please understand, I have a lot of respect for him. I quote his work in my own work, etc. But this was after what came to be known as the Potter Affair. And there's this claim that you can't be both. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And I want to say, of course you can. Of course you can, and in fact, more so, you ought to want to do that, and you ought to find a way to do that. So that's what the rest of this is about. How do you have your cake and eat it too? So in that context, I just want to share some work that I do right now, which is in the area of genome editing. It's around CRISPR technology. And for those of you who don't know, we have the capacity now to go in and to cut the the DNA, to make a double-stranded cut with the goal or objective of changing the genetic structure. That's huge. And the question I'm interested in is, what does it mean for us, humans, to willfully take over the evolutionary story? Right? That's huge. Huge science. And then the second area in which I'm doing some work is, has to do with more generally reproductive technologies, and right now looking at the issue of payment, payment for surrogacy, payment for gametes, so sperm and egg. And those of you who may have been following the news may know that on Tuesday of this week, Mr. Anthony Housefather introduced a bill attempting to change the current legislation. Right now in Canada, it is illegal for you to sell your sperm and egg. Sorry, I said that wrong. It is illegal for you to buy sperm and egg. It is not illegal for you to sell sperm and egg. Sorry, I've been saying this repeatedly for the past two or three days with the reporters, and it's really important that I get it right. 
But anyhow, he wants to remove the prohibitions on payment. And I think that's deeply problematic. I don't want to live in a country where we encourage the commodification of the human body. So what I want to do is share with you different creative ways in which I try to get different messages across. So this here, believe it or not, is a whole talk, 15 minutes. Um, each of those slides is actually a separate slide in which I talk about the ethics of genome editing. And the point of that particular lecture is to say that if we are going to manipulate the human genome, it's absolutely critical that that be a communal decision. And I talk and write about that in terms of broad societal consensus. And so the claim there is whatever decisions we're going to make, they don't belong to elites. They don't belong to political elites, scientific elites, corporate elites, et cetera. They belong to all of us because in some sense the human genome belongs to all of us. Now, don't misunderstand me, there is no such thing as the one human genome, but it is this idea that, again, if structurally we think it's acceptable for us to start manipulating the stuff of life, we ought to somehow all have some kind of say in what we think that should look like and what direction it should go in. But the point of putting up this slide here is to show to you that I went to a local artist, Emma Fitzgerald, and I said, here, Emma, meet with me. I'm going to tell you what I'm trying to communicate, and I would really like it if you could just draw out my ideas so that I can then talk my way through it. And if anybody's interested, that talk is up on YouTube. If you were to put in my name and the words falling walls, because it was a talk I gave in Berlin on the anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down, under the theme of what's the next wall that needs to come down. And I'm talking about take down the walls around the lab, take down the walls around the boardroom, take us into the kitchen, we all have to eat. And what would conversations look like if the most meaningful and important conversations happened in kitchens? I don't just do public speaking, I also write for blogs. And this is just an example, it's a series of blogs over several months, and in that context I'm trying to again communicate in very short pieces, 700 words, what are my views about genome editing. And just to make sure that I'm always able to publish my views, I actually started the blog in 2013. But what's really important is, although this blog is managed out of my office, I probably only publish there four or five times a year because it's not my blog in the sense of for me and to only share my ideas. It was to create a space for academics who wanted to say something to other people. It was to create a space for patients to say something back to academics. It was a place for people who work in the healthcare system because my area of expertise is bioethics to have a space. And it's been wildly successful. And some of our most popular uh, blogs have uh, upwards of 20,000 views. Now, I can't say that they've read the whole thing, but it's only 700 words, so the chances are pretty high that if you clicked it open, you might have finished reading it. And this is an invitation to any of you to please look at the blog. And if you have the slightest interest in writing for it, um, we're happy to receive those submissions. But the thing is that's really important is it isn't just to write the blog, it's like how do you do the dissemination? And this is work that I've done for a different blog called The Conversation. And what I wanted to show you here is what happens. You know, so here I have Andre Picard who follows me. Well, he's got a, a monster following from, from, you know, compared to what I have, right? So that's the same thing. Like how do I make the powerful care? Recognizing my influence, my circle is pretty small. His is a lot greater than mine. And the other one is the Center for Genetics and Society in California. And the next one is the Nuffield Council in the United Kingdom. And then there's Informed Opinions, which is promoting women as having intelligent things to say about topics other than are men obsolete, right? Um, and so one of the things that's really important is it's actually a lot easier to get this kind of information out to the public than it is for me to put up a link to an article that's behind a paywall, right? How, how is anybody going to have access to my ideas? So the thing, though, that's really important to understand is there are ways in which we can now actually begin to track it. And this is where I have just a little bit of hope that something might happen. So let me explain this slide. Although I started a blog, the blog is called Impact Ethics, I make a point of writing for a number of places. I write for Healthy Debate. I write for the um, IJ Fab blog, et cetera. And I've also written for The Conversation. The conversation is a place where all academics at any university can publish, but there's a little wrinkle. Universities can also sign up to be part of the conversation, and that's a cost. It comes to the cost of about $30,000. And what does the university get for $30,000? It gets this. It gets the analytic data. So what it means is 
my president can actually track who is contributing to the conversation, literally by name. He can then find out how many articles have you put up there, who's reading them. Well, the who is more the geography around the world. There are some still privacy <laughs> issues that are, are well taken care of there. But what it also allows you to do for the university is that they can actually compare themselves to other institutions. Now, I want to say these were the ones that I could find quickly that were Canadian. It turns out there's not as many Canadian universities as yet participating. So I would start to type in something and it would do the autocomplete and I'd be in some other country with some other university. But one of the things that I think is really important is actually what this means is that there's a chance that universities are going to start to see this as something worth measuring. Now, in a way, I'm sad that we always have to measure things, but at least this is different from an impact factor. This is actually saying, okay, we think it's worth recognizing that the people in our community are making important contributions and they don't look like academic articles. The other thing I want to talk about, though, very explicitly is this phenomenon of laddering. And I've already sort of alluded to it, but I'm going to give you two or three examples to make it really, really clear. This is an example of laddering that happened in one particular direction. I was invited by CBC, uh, The Current, to participate in an interview with Jacques Cohen around mitochondrial replacement technology. That's the term that's used in my academic work. I actually dispute that language. But what that is is what you might know as the three-parent baby. So that's in the context where you take sperm from a male, and then you take an egg from a female partner for this male, and then you take a second egg from a donor. And the idea there is that you're actually replacing the mitochondria from one egg with the other. This isn't a lecture on reproductive technology, so I'm going to stop there. But what I want to show you here is that having done that interview and having spoken with one of the scientists who's involved, I come back to my office and I write an academic paper. And that gets published. And then two years later, the science has moved along, and I go back to it, and I write a second academic paper. And then the last academic paper that I've written has come out just in the past month. And it's specifically now people wanting to use that technology in the context of a same-sex relationship. And I'm saying, no, the technology should not be used to that end. But I say explicitly, I want to live in a world where we value family making and we recognize and treasure all kinds of families. I don't think this technology should be used by anybody. So it's not about the nature of the relationship between the couple, it's about the use of technology in the context of reproduction. Why? Because I have a consistent view that it's about overvaluing, overvaluing genetics. And that when we do that, we undermine other legitimate ways of making families by saying the only real families are the ones where we can make genetic ties. My point to take away is that started with the radio interview. What if I had said, no, I'm a very busy person. I've got lots of projects on the go. I might never have turned my attention to this, and yet I think I'm making important contributions, all spurred by an invitation to go on the radio. This is a different kind of example, which turns into being relevant just this week. And the reason I wanted to put up this phenomenon of laddering is that the first article I wrote with a colleague of mine, Alana Catapan, published it in the Toronto Star. That's an article from 2016, and it's relevant today. So I can go back, I can find the article, and I can tweet it out today and say, if you want to know about the facts around sperm and sperm banks in Canada, read this. So it has a life that's very different from the life of an academic paper. This is more recent, and again, this phenomenon of laddering invited to do something on the radio. And what I wanted to show you here is that somebody else now is helping me get my message out, because they have an interest in promoting their own radio show. It's not about promoting me or my topic. They're promoting their show. Other people are then able to retweet that and promote the show. And then after the show's over, then now I get to move into the realm of tweeting it out to my interest group. And so here I'm using Facebook to say, look, if you're interested in this topic, I did a radio interview this morning, and you can find it here. And then what happens when I put it to my Facebook page, I get people who comment. And then I take some time to answer those comments. Now, that's all labor-intensive. And it's really hard for people to keep doing that if the institution doesn't recognize how labor intensive that is. So that was not me just being at the radio for one hour. When I go on the radio, I prepare. I prepare the same way you would prepare for a classroom. And so, you know, I don't know what it takes you, but for every hour I stand up in front of a classroom, there's three to five hours behind that. So I have done that same level of work to go on to the radio for maybe 15 minutes. 
but it's because I don't know where the radio interviewer is going, and I've got to be able to answer every question to the best of my ability. But look at that. Afterwards, I come back out, I'm putting it to Facebook, I'm engaging, etc. That's a huge commitment. And if your university doesn't value it, how often are you going to do it? Now, at this point, it's really important for me to come back and say, why am I able to do that? Why do I get invited to go to the radio and get this kind of fallout? Why am I able to take time to write that? It's because I am doing this work that all of us know is important, right? This is what we're trained to do, and this is what you have to keep doing. And I've just put up here a cluster of articles that I wrote over probably three or four years, but they all say the same thing. It's not dishonesty, okay? They're not really saying the same thing. It's just sort of the same theme, shall we say. But what I'm saying is the government has not done its job. So I am calling out the federal government in each of those papers in different ways about what? We have a piece of legislation on assisted human reproduction that says explicitly in law since 2004 that it is illegal to buy egg, sperm, and the services of a surrogate. That's section six and seven of the legislation. But later on in that same piece of legislation, section 12, it says you can, however, reimburse people for out-of-pocket expenses. So you shouldn't have to be out-of-pocket if you want to be altruistic. But you must do that reimbursement in accordance with the regulations. Okay, so recap, very simple. The law says in section 6 and 7 you can't pay for this. And then in section 12 it says, however, you can reimburse if you do it in accordance with the regulations. And then the government never writes the regulations. Right? So, I mean, what's the net effect? The net effect now is you can't even legitimately have confidence that you could reimburse and not be guilty of some kind of crime. And so these are five different articles over a span of time, every time something new happens, saying, government, do your job. It is wrong for Canadians who want to be law-abiding Canadians to not know what the law is. And finally, in 2016, with a new government, they actually said, Health Canada said, we will strengthen the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, and they are currently, finally, writing those regulations. And when they do, I hope they're good, and if they're not, I'll tell them they're not good. <laughs> but one of the things that allows me to say with confidence, if they're not good, I will tell them that, is because I think that if you criticize someone, and then they do something good, you should also go back and compliment them. But in that context, I then have another obligation, which is to contribute to that process. So just as Health Canada is now working to try to write those regulations, I am working to participate in the way that any Canadian can participate, which is I'm participating in the public consultation activity. And I'm doing this alone, and I'm doing this with colleagues. So I'm doing what any Canadian in this room can do, which is I have an opinion, and I'm writing, and I'm telling the government, these are my opinions with respect to this law project. And yet, at the same time that this is happening, we have Mr. Anthony Housefather, who has introduced a private member's bill, which is, in effect, undermining the work that Health Canada is doing in terms of drafting the regulations and saying, look, don't bother drafting the regulations. Just take out the prohibitions, and let's just have a commercial system. So now, I'm not only having to try to work and do policy work with Health Canada, saying this is what I think the regulations should look like, I'm also having to do work and say to Mr. Anthony Housefather, please go away. What I want to do now is just say very importantly that what becomes important in this activity is not just the laddering, but the commitment to amplify. And I've shown a little bit of that in terms of the work that you do and then getting other people to you know, spread the word for you. But what I'm showing you here is that I have an obligation then to spread the word too. So if I want Andre Picard to retweet me or the Canadian Center for, sorry, the Center for Genetics and Society in California to retweet me or the Nuffield Council, I have to pay them the same courtesy. I have to be looking to find ways in which I am either retweeting my work out to them in a directed way, or I'm supporting other academics. So now think about what that means in terms of a time commitment, that I'm not only doing my work, I'm actually watching for what my colleagues are doing. But I owe them that the same way that we think we owe our colleagues to do peer review, right? We do peer review not because, you know, we have nothing else to do, right? We do that because we know that we depend on other people to peer review our articles, and so it's part of being a good citizen. Well, guess what? That same rationale starts to apply here. And so again, think about how labor intense it is, but it only works if you're paying attention. And here I just wanted to show that I do it not only in the areas in which I do work, but also just about the academy generally, because I take that to be a really important theme. And so in the same context, I'm trying to address a range of issues about the problems that we have in the academic setting. 
there are risks to this. And often when I give a version of this kind of talk where I'm trying to encourage people to step outside their comfort zone, I have a number of young people that say to me, well, Francoise, you know, that's kind of okay for you. You're at the end of your career, and if you blow out, it hardly matters. But, you know, I don't have tenure yet. And I have to say to you that I'm very sympathetic to that. I do understand that. I especially understand that when I see how hard young people have to work to get that first tenure track job. But I'll say back to you what I worry about is I think if you spend seven years being a certain kind of academic, it's really hard to transform yourself once you've gotten the security of tenure. And then it also becomes very difficult to understand the obligations that come with tenure. The most important obligation that comes with tenure is to speak out. That's the only reason you get that privilege. No one else has that. And it was given to us so that we would stand up and we would speak out knowing that hopefully we would be protected in terms of our ability to continue to work. So what happens is it means you are at risk. You are at risk how? You get trolls. You get people who say things that are not so nice. And I have to say, this is particularly hurtful because this is a person for whom I have done a fair bit of work, who's been a member of my research teams over the years, and for whom I even wrote a letter for his status as emeritus professor. So it's not just that you have anonymous people who will attack you. It is that you have people that you thought were colleagues who will attack you. But the other side of that is that there are people who will stand up for you and will say thank you. Thank you for speaking out in places where I don't have a voice. And then my challenge is to figure out how do I find a way of speaking with and not speaking for? Because that just becomes another form or it's at risk of becoming another form of oppression. So what I'm trying to say here is you, know, you can take a pretty straight road and try and sort of get through life or you can kind of commit to the ups and the downs, the hills and the valleys, you know? And I've obviously chosen the hills and the valleys, which is to say that I have some very dark days when I'm kind of depressed and disappointed about the way I'm able to navigate the world or not, but I have some tremendous highs when I think, you know what, it made a difference. I'm so glad I was able to make that difference. This is what I'm working on now, as I said to you before, it's this notion of assisted human reproduction and the legislation around that. And what I've tried to highlight on this slide is what we are trained to do and what I'm asking you to learn to do. And when I say that, I say that recognizing we're all very intelligent people and we don't often understand that there's lots of opportunities for very intelligent people to keep learning. So this is one of the things we need to do. We need to learn how to do all of this. And these are just illustrations around one topic. I'm showing you here examples of my participating in the policy consultation by writing, which any Canadian can do. I'm just writing a letter to the government saying, think about these things. There's a deck of slides there because I did have the opportunity to meet with people within Health Canada where I'm trying to say these are the things I think you should think about. And I'm still talking on the radio or writing articles, but all of that with a view to having an impact on the world. I'm coming an end to, my, to the end of my time, and what I want to do now is encourage you to do one thing that would be practicing some of what I'm trying to suggest. I'm about to show you a video. This is the premiere of my first Twitter video. So I had to make a video that was going to be only two minutes long, so I got to hope that somebody who gets this on Twitter is going to take the two minutes to watch it. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to pay attention, but I'm then going to ask you to tweet it out to whatever your community is. So those of you who have phones and are used to tweeting, um, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But this is a premiere, and I don't know if people do that for a Twitter video, because I've never done that, but this is the premiere of my Twitter video. The body economy, human eggs in the marketplace. Let's talk about sperm and eggs, the spark of human life, right? Well, what exactly are they worth? How do we put a price tag on these fundamental cells? Or do we? These are questions on the Canadian policy agenda right now. I'm Francoise Bayliss. I'm a bioethicist at Dalhousie University. I want you to think about these questions because the answers we come up with will shape how we value our bodies and what's inside them for years to come. This year, the Government of Canada is drafting new regulations to strengthen the 14-year-old Assisted Human Reproduction Act. It's about time. 
Egg donation has long been part of an unregulated gray market, with private fertility clinics, lawyers, and online brokers all staking a claim. For women, this is complex and emotional territory. There is no harmonized system for egg donation or national oversight. There are many competing interests, very little health research is being done, and the marketplace is in flux. Yes, there's deep empathy for those desperately longing for children. Yet there can be deep inequity and outright exploitation if egg donors are themselves in a desperate situation. Should we set flat fees for egg providers to cover costs, like in the United Kingdom? Do we let the market decide, like the United States? Or is altruism the Canadian way, gifting, not selling the spark of human life? The decisions we make in the body economy will have a fundamental impact on what we value and who we are as human beings. Learn more at impactethics.ca and join the conversation at hashtag the body economy. So, <laughs> well, I hope you like that. Um, that's a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of effort. And again, my university, and I expect this university, has no way of valorizing that kind of work, but it's the work that's important because I want to find ways of talking effectively to Canadians. And so what I want to ask some of you to do is help me. If you could take a minute, if you go to YouTube, you will find the video. You just need to say the body economy and hopefully it comes up as the first video because we've just made it live this week. And what I'd like you to do is to please tweet that out with the hashtag for Congress and the hashtag the body economy. And one of the things that I'll be able to do over time is actually see if we're getting the message out. But this is a way in which people can participate in that activity of amplifying something that they believe in. If you don't believe in it, then you don't have to tweet it. But don't, don't send it out right now with a negative comment. <laughs> this is something I haven't done yet, but which I'm going to try to do. These are called tweetorials, and I haven't quite figured out how to do that, but that's going to be my next experiment. But this is somebody else who's very skilled at doing that, and that's basically a way of cheating to kind of get more text than you're allowed with tweets, but something I need to learn about. And I want to end by saying what's really important here is to understand you cannot do the work that I'm asking you to do if you don't do what you already know how to do really well. And so the question is, how do you keep doing what you know how to do really well? And how do we get you to want to do the other? And how do we get the institution to provide the infrastructure that you need so that you can do that with enthusiasm? I want to end with quoting a colleague of mine, Alice Dreger, this past week we published our book, Bioethics in Action, and one of the things that Alice and I have in common is this deep commitment to understanding that you need to move the academy out into the world. We do not want to become irrelevant, and I hope you do not want to be irrelevant, and the only way we can do that is by reaching out, engaging with others, challenging each other, and making a contribution to this great country. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Davis, for that very rich and provocative talk. Um, we now have time for some questions. And as Dr. Bayliss has said, those questions are welcome either in English or in French. If you could just go to one of the microphones uh, on either side there, and uh, perhaps you could state your name and your institutional affiliation, and then ask your question. We'd be happy to, uh, to take those. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bayliss. Uh, really interesting stuff. My research is also around knowledge mobilization and public engagement. My name is Garrett Richards. I'm from the University of Saskatchewan. And my question was about, uh, there was one slide in particular where you showed a number of articles that you had written, and it sounded like you had, had timed those articles to certain news cycles, and, and you were trying to speak to relevant conversations on the agenda. And my question was about the, the mediums that you were choosing, because it looked to me like some of them were journal articles, and some of them may have been uh, not academic uh, journals, but that sort of pseudo space where it's sort of a, for a profession. Uh, how do you choose between the medium that you're going to use? Because I can't publish a journal article quickly, or even count on policymakers or the public reading it, but at the same time, writing an opinion editorial uh, 
isn't going to count for much on my CV. So how do you navigate that trade-off and what sorts of mediums do you use to do that? So one of the things that I think is really important is to recognize that there are policy windows and they open and close and you have no control over when that happens. And so I actually work understanding that that's going to happen. And so I try to do things proactively so that I'm in a position that when that policy windows, window opens, I can grab it. So for example, on Tuesday, Mr. Housefather introduced his bill. I just happened to have this video ready to go today, Thursday. I could not possibly have known that that was going to happen. But I now have it. And now that I've done my premiere, when this is over, I'm going to go tweet it out. I'm going to tweet it at him. Um, but that's what I mean by saying, I'm, I'm working on something. I know it's important. And I'm trying to be proactive so that I have things that I can draw on. Again, that was part of the reason for putting up the article that was in the Toronto Star and, and letting you know that Alana and I wrote that in 2016. But today, I can go to it and I can get it out there again. When I do my own writing uh, in sort of more professional journals and, and that space, one of the things that I do, which I've tried to encourage my students to do, and this is, an, this is a good question because it allows me to make a different kind of point around the academy and what it values. Different journals have different impact factors. And one of the things that I think is really unfortunate is that people pay attention to that and they make decisions about where to publish based on what the impact factor is and what they then think they can you know, say about themselves because they've gotten into this great journal. But I say back to you know, my colleagues, but what if that doesn't reach the right audience? Like, Who cares if you got it into that journal if the journal that the audience you need to reach is reading something else? And so that's why you will have seen, for example, a couple of articles in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Why? Because everything that I'm talking about is going to impact the way in which they practice. And I want them to be able to contribute to the conversations happening within their professional group. Um, if I publish that in a philosophy journal, they are never going to read it. Um, and quite frankly, they're not going to read it not just because they can't find it, but because it's going to be off-putting. Right? It's like, I don't, I don't do philosophy. I don't want to read philosophy. And honestly, when I write for a philosophy journal, I am making certain assumptions about background terms and concepts that I don't explain. Whereas when I'm writing for a professional audience, I don't make those assumptions. And so I do write differently. And that, I think, brings me back to a point about you know, people who have skills needing to learn other skills. It's really hard to write those 700 words. So you know, when I say you know, it's a blog and it's 700 words, it's really difficult. And I was very lucky. I had friends who were journalists. And I asked them to read it. And I can tell you, it's really hard when you get the stuff scribbled over um, and it's sent back to you. And it's like you're being told this is a piece of crap. And you think, gee, I've been working you know, for a long time at this. Um, but it's hard. So thank you for the question. I think that I use any and all opportunities that are available to me, time permitting. Um, but I'm always doing that understanding. I don't know when that policy window is going to open, but I have to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Margaret Kovach, and I'm a faculty member at uh, the University of Saskatchewan. And one of the areas that I'm, I'm interested in having your insight on, because I, I really appreciate what you're saying about what I see increasingly, which is the monetarization of research. And that research is a research grant rather than research as scholarship. One of my areas that I'm, I'm taking up within the work I do is looking at Indigenous oracy and how is that being valued and upheld because right now we really don't have the policies or the standards, particularly in tenure promotion, to really understand what uh, Indigenous oracy means, Indigenous oral dissemination of knowledge, and how that can be uh, upheld and how that can be recognized. and. I'm kind of more sort of um, on the more senior end, but I see graduate students, in particularly indigenous graduate students, and I see indi uh, indigenous junior or uh, tenure track folks who are coming into the academy, and they're wanting to do oral dissemination of knowledge. They're wanting to take up indigenous oracy, but there is a real, um, within the culture and within the policies of academia, there is uh, not a real understanding of that, what that means, and hence, not an ability to recognize it. And I'm really concerned because we're talking 
about indigenization of the academy and we're doing I think a lot of really important things and I uphold academic institutions for what they're doing but I think there is really a shying away of the critical questions like standards on tenure and promotion about um, there's, there's a lack of recognition, I think, or understanding of what Indigenous scholarship means and that if we really do want to indigenize the academy, we have to uphold oral dissemination of knowledge. Indigenous scholarship, it, that is a part of Indigenous scholarship. There is no Indigenous scholarship without that. And right now I really see uh, an academy who is unable to recognize, so I really see parallels between what you're talking about in terms of public scholarship and how do we recognize the work put into that with Indigenous oracy and indigenizing the academy. So any comments you have would be really great. So let me just offer a couple of comments. So first of all, I value experiential knowledge and that's one of the things that really spurred me to uh, develop the blog. And one of the things that I do with the blog is, as I said, I actually limit my contributions to four or five over the span of the 12 months. But I spend a lot of time, every time I hear a story, going to people and saying, will you write something for the blog? And I can tell you um, that the blogs that I'm most proud of are the ones that are written by patients, for example. And you know, writing that blog is very intimidating for them. And I say, look, just write everything that you need to say, and then I'll help you. And I can tell you there are blogs that I have spent more time on than I have spent writing an academic paper. And that certainly is never showing up in anything that I do. I mean, I don't even have authorship, right? Because I wouldn't take that. But I think what I th you know, would want to say back to you is that for the institution to change, there has to be a willingness to listen. And I do know that there are pockets that are willing to listen. There really are. So I, I don't want people to leave here thinking that I'm only negative. I think there are, there are places that are deaf. Um, and, and I keep knocking on that door. Um, but there are other places that are willing to listen. And uh, what matters then is role models. And quite frankly, what matters is somebody has to go out there and be willing to keep speaking. So one of the things I didn't get to say, but I, I will say it now, you'll recall I had a slide with many uh, pictures. And I talked about there, my, my work there is the work of architect. And it is about changing the space in which conversations can happen. And part of what I talk about there is that it isn't just about designing the space, because you can say back to me a million times, the door's wide open, walk in. And I say, I'm not walking through that door. Why would I do that? It's not a welcoming space. It's not a space that respects me. It's not a space that values what I have to say, et cetera. And so part of what I think is the work that I need to do comes under uh, the following metaphors. One is the architect, and the other is the advocate. And those are the two kinds of realms in which I'm trying to work. How do I create spaces where people can come and people can share their knowledge? And that, is, that, that creates a certain set of responsibilities. And then given the way I work, I have to find the powerful people. And they either already care, and then I've got a friend, or I have to find a way to make them care. Um, so I would say back to you, find who your allies are and work with them. There are people out there who care, and there are other people that are educable. They want to care. They just need to be helped to care. Hi, I'm Lori Latta from the University of Regina. I just wanted to know a little bit more about how that um, democratic dialogue takes place at these spaces that you use. So I actually use work that was done uh, by a feminist group in the United States in the 60s who were actually uh, camped out and advocating against nuclear power. And in that context, women were coming from around the world to be part of this activist organization, and they had to find ways of working together. Um, and they developed a pamphlet, and it truly is a pamphlet. So I had to go and find this through the archives. See, and that's the skill you get as an academic, how to go to archives and find these old, tattered pamphlets, um, in which they described consensus making in a way that was not about 100% agreement. And so I used that framework. And what they talk about there are things like um, responsibility for participating in the conversation. And so part of what they're saying is, what does it mean to actually take responsibility for what you say and for when you're silent? And that it's not appropriate to sit through a whole conversation for however long that conversation takes place, and at the end then just sort of, you know, peremptorily say, I disagree. And so that would be a non-responsible way of participating in the conversation. Another non-responsible way of participating in the conversation is to withhold your consent because you didn't get your way. As opposed to recognizing that, look, I have been heard. 
And I can tell you that's a really painful thing because I have been in meetings where you know, I keep saying the same thing over and over again. And despite what I think is my skill set, I'm not able to persuade. And at some point, the honorable thing to do is to say, I'm not in sync with this group and I have to step back. Um, and maybe I'm wrong. Um, and so one of the other things that becomes really important is a certain kind of humility. If you're actually participating in any kind of a consensus building exercise and you don't go in there with the view that maybe I'm the one that's wrong, maybe I'm the one that needs to change, then you can't even genuinely participate. And one of the things that's really important in the work that those women did is they talk about the importance of struggle. And what I think is important about that is recognizing it's going to be hard work and that if you do it, you're going to struggle throughout it. And most importantly, you may even struggle afterwards because if you've had a genuine process, when you leave that process, you have to support that process because otherwise, again, you didn't go into it um, honestly with the view of trying to find what's best for the community. So in that context, I typically spend a lot of time at the beginning of any session trying to expose values and how values make us vulnerable. So if you'll allow me, I'll just indulge and I'll share one of the things I use when uh, I first start working with a group. And I tell them the fable about the uh, porcupine and the moles. Anybody know that fable? Very simply, um, the moles are very responsible and they build themselves a house for the winter so that they can all hunker down. And the porcupine was not so responsible, didn't build himself a hole, and it's getting cold. And so he comes to the moles and he says, hi, can I, can I share your house? And the moles are pretty nice, and they say, sure, come on, move in, moves in. And um, every time he moves, he kind of pricks them. <laughs> and the moles are now thinking, you know, it wasn't such a good idea. We were trying to be nice, but, you know, really? And so the moles get together, and they say, look, we're really sorry. We were trying to be nice, but you have to leave. And the porcupine says, no, I like it. I like it. It's pretty fine here. I think, I think I'll stay for the winter. And then I stop, and I say, so to the audience or the group that I'm working with, how are we gonna solve that problem? And what's interesting is people feel quite comfortable talking about moles and porcupines. They feel a lot less comfortable talking about human beings with faces that they're supposed to care about. So people have very strong ideas about whether the porcupine should be forced to leave or whether the moles should be more accommodating or whatever. And so what happens is it provides me with an opportunity to help people understand what are the values that they're bringing to bear to the solving of this particular problem. And then we just talk about the values, right? And we get a better understanding of what's at stake for different people. Shall I tell you what the best answer was to this question? Why don't we just wrap the porcupine in a towel, <laughs> right? And then he could stay. <laughs> There are other solutions people come up with, but you know, I think what happens is as people put forward solutions, you start seeing who they are, what they care about, and where they're trying to take the group. And one of the things that becomes really wonderful is that then over time you've built enough trust that you can move from that kind of a story to the real issue that you're trying to deal with. And I can tell you that some of these conversations go on over months, some have even gone on over years, but the most amazing thing for me when I know that I've done that work well is when somebody is unable to attend a meeting and somebody else will say, but you know, if so-and-so was here, they would be reminding us of this, right? And that's when you're moving towards genuine consensus because you've got respect for a view that you may not even agree with, but you understand it's an important view to have on the table. And that really means we are trying to do what's good for everyone, recognizing that at the end of the day, whatever we come up with is not going to satisfy everyone. So thank you for the question, and I think it's a complicated issue, but I think if we don't try, then we really are just deferring to power in a way that I think is not appropriate. And uh, with that, I'm uh, sorry to say we're out of time. Time is up, but I do want you to know that the uh, lecture today has been recorded and will be available from the Congress website shortly. I'd like very much to thank Dr. Velas for, again, a very rich and provocative and thoughtful talk. And we have a small token of our appreciation. <laughs> there we are. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just a couple of words of thanks to, to uh, Shirk, of course, and to Universities Canada and the Canada Foundation for Innovation for their sponsorship of this event. And a reminder, too, as Gabriel mentioned earlier, uh, the speaker this evening is Alan Murabit. That is 7 o'clock in this room. The lecture will be delivered in English. 
but will be available with uh, interpretation in French. Merci bien for attending today. And again, Dr. Bayless, thank you very, very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you.